ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय श्रीमद भागवतम ग्रंथ वन चैप्टर टू टेक्स टू ट्रांसलेशन एंड कमेंट्री बाय His divine grace, Shila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya Viskant. Sorry, text three. Adhyatma Deepa Mati Tesha Tam Tam Monam Dham Sangsari Nam Karuna Yaha Purana Guhyam Sang Vyasa Sunam Upayami Gurung Muni Nam By experiencing the message of Bhagavatam in his life, He gained so many realizations that he was able to convey to Parikshit Maharaj and others. The Krishna consciousness is a dynamic principle. Pratyakshavagamam dhanyam sisukam kartanavyayam raja vidya raja guhya pavitram paramutamam This uh, king of knowledge is the most secret of all secrets, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. It is the most pure. But this knowledge is not simply something to be studied and learned like ordinary academic knowledge, but it is to be practically experienced in life. And what kind of experience will that be? A very happy one. Brahma Bhuta Prasannatna Na Shochati Na Kangshati One who is on the spiritual platform, he's happy. He does not lament or hanker for anything on the material platform. Or as Srila Prabhupada often used to say, a devotee is jolly. A devotee is not lamenting, he's not sad. One of the symptoms of an advanced devotee is that he's always happy. Not the happiness of fools. As Prabhupada described, there are two kinds of happy people in this world. One is happy like an ass. The ass also thinks, I'm very happy. All I have to do is work hard 16 hours a day, and I get this wonderful pile of grass at the end of the day. He doesn't think that grass is available everywhere. He doesn't have to work. And all I have to do is tolerate a few kicks in the face from Mrs. Ass, And then I can enjoy wonderful sex life with them. What a wonderful life I'm leading. This is the happiness of a fool. The other kind of happy person is fully self-realized. He's enjoying Brahma Sukh or spiritual happiness. The topmost platform, the topmost platform of which is Krishna Prema Sukh, the happiness of love of Krishna. And the ass is enjoying Maya Sukh, the happiness of Maya, which means... Uh, the happiness that is gained from temporary relief from suffering. Sometimes, um, Prabhupada, he was always in, Prabhupada was always insisting in his preaching that this material world is a place of suffering. There's no happiness here. So some people would say, well, you know, there has to be some unhappiness, otherwise how can you appreciate happiness when it comes? So Prabhupada would say, well, let me beat you over the head with a stick, and then when I stop, you can enjoy the pleasure of my having stopped beating you. That is not happiness. People in this material world are suffering so much that they take the, the se- temporary cessation of suffering, temporary relief to be happiness. Or they take the uh, interaction of the senses with the sense objects to be happiness. The topmost manifestation of which is the rubbing of one skin against another. Because someone identifies himself with this conglomeration of blood, bone, skin, fat, muscles, etc. Liver, kidney, intestines, lungs, brain. Someone identifies himself with all of these things and thinks that the shape of the bag in which it is placed is very attractive. So he thinks to rub one such bag against another is the perfection of life. This is material happiness. And spiritual happiness begins with understanding I'm not the body. This was Shukadeva Goswami's understanding. That is the Brahma Bhuta stage, the stage of impersonal understanding. That is the beginning stage of understanding, to understand I'm not the body, I'm spirit. Aham Brahmasmi. Then uh, that has to be developed to understand I'm spirit. What is my relationship with the Supreme Spirit? Shukadeva Goswami was already a self-realized soul. He had no material desires. He wasn't interested in eating, sleeping, mating, defending, or any such things. So when he heard the message of Bhagavatam being recited, he was surprised at the effect it had upon him. 
He was moving in this world, detached from everything, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling and tasting, but not identifying with anything that he saw, touched, smelled, heard or tasted. But when he heard the Bhagavatam being recited, he discovered a different kind of emotion taking place in his heart. Although by his transcendental intelligence and his uh, realization of transcendence, he was not attracted to anything in this world. He found himself being attracted to the Bhagavatam. So this could have meant one of two things. That either he had descended again to the material plane and was being attracted by a material narration, but he did not find any such uh, material motivation within himself. Therefore, he had to come to the other conclusion that this narration is attracting me on the transcendental platform on which I am situated. So hearing the Bhagavatam uh, being recited by the disciples of Vyasadeva awakened in Shukadeva Goswami the understanding that there is further to go than in simply Brahma Bhuta stage. The impersonal platform is described in the Upanishads as neti neti, not this, not this, not this. I'm not interested in this or this or this or this or anything else in the material world. Whatever you see, not interested in it. But when he heard the Bhagavatam, then yes, he was interested in this. No, when he heard Bhagavatam, he had an interest in him. Not this, not this, not yes, this. This is very nice. This uh, very inquiry about how Shukadeva Goswami became attracted to hear the Bhagavatam was asked by Shona Grishi to Sutta Goswami. He said that, well, Shukadeva Goswami was already self-realized. He was situated on the, top, on, on the topmost platform of realization, beyond material desire and lamentation. Then, why did he undertake to study the Bhagavatam? Why, sh- why should a self-realized person do anything? Especially, why should he undertake the study of such a vast work? It's a very big job to study the Bhagavatam. So the reply is uh, one of the most important facets of Krishna conscious understanding. What is that reply? Can anyone say? Yeah, you can say. Anyone else knows? Some of you have read the Bhagavatam, but you didn't catch this point. It's a very, very important point. Or it's there elaborately described in teachings of Lord Chaitanya also. Okay, say the verse. Atnaramascha munayo negranta apyurokramaha Kovantya haitu king bhaktim itam bhuta gano harihi harihi that, that uh, even those great self-realized souls who are self-satisfied within themselves who are beyond any rules and regulations uh, of this material world of the Vanashram system they become attracted to the narrations of Krishna and thus they engage in unmoted devotional service and Hmm? Yeah, becoming attracted to actually to the qualities of Krishna they're attracted to the qualities of Krishna and thus they become engaged in unmotivated devotional service mm-hmm. now self-realized means that they're beyond the modes of material nature they're beyond the qualities of material nature the three modes and three qualities goodness, passion and ignorance sattva gun, raja gun, tamagun the mode of goodness, passion and ignorance so they're beyond the material qualities, but they are attracted by the qualities, itam bhuta guna guna hari, they're attracted by the qualities of Krishna. This is because Krishna's qualities are transcendental. Those on the path of impersonal realization are very much concerned to become nirguna, beyond or without qualities. So the um, transcendental position or the absolute truth is described in the Vedanta, as nirguna, without qualities. But the absolute truth, Krishna is also described as samasta guna gana dhamma, or the abode of all qualities. What is that the Sri Vaishnava say? That, uh, ananta, kalya, uh, ananta kalyana guna vishishta. He is imbued with uh, unlimited beneficial qualities. Ananta kalyana guna vishishta. Imbued with, imbued with uh, unlimited kalyana guna means beneficial qualities. So that he is without qualities means without any material, <coughs> without any material qualities. So those who are endeavoring so much to become free from material qualities, they still have to discover the transcendental qualities of Krishna. 
Sugadev Goswami explains in the Bhagavatam his realization of the transcendental qualities of Krishna in his various incarnations. These are listed, some of the prominent qualities of Krishna are listed in the nectar of devotion. We'll find so many wonderful qualities of Krishna described in the Bhagavatam. How he is always very pleasing, how he is very merciful, how he is obliged to his devotees, how he is truthful, how he is a pleasing speaker, how he is an expert dresser. He's very respectful to elder, elderly and senior persons. So all these qualities may be exhibited on the material platform also. But they gain their, uh, or, or they have their transcendental existence in Krishna. The exchange of uh, relationships between Krishna and his devotees is transcendental. That means there is no motive to exploit the other. Uh, in dealings on the spiritual platform, there is no, no motive to exploit the other. There is no ignorance of identifying with the material body, and it is not subject to time. It is not destroyed by time. Material relationships are destroyed by time. I love you forever, the lovers declare. But it is impossible on the material platform. We are brought together, just like twigs floating in the river are brought together, and then they, they, they stay together in a group, and after some time they hit a rock, and then they again diffused and they form different groups. So on the material platform there is no question of eternal love. There is no question of love, let alone eternal love. To identif- Any uh, exchange based upon identification with the material body and mind cannot properly be termed love. But we mistake it. To- but Krishna doesn't forget us. Even though we don't maintain our transcendent, our transcendent relation with Krishna, Krishna maintains his transcendental relationship with us. That means that even though we forget him, he doesn't forget us. He's always ready to accept us back. On the material platform, if one person mistreats another or rejects them or insults them, then the other person will reciprocally reject the person who is misbehaving with them. Maybe not immediately, but after some time, anyone's tolerance will wear down. And even if they are very tolerant and they don't become reciprocally nasty with the other person, they will not like to associate with them or be with them. However, Krishna, his love for us is unconditional. We may think that we are being asked to give our unconditional love to Krishna. That is a very great demand. We may think that that being asked to give our unconditional love to Krishna is a very great demand. But Krishna gives his unconditional love to us. And the evidence is that even though we reject him for for millions and millions of births, he still remembers us, desires our welfare, acts for our welfare. And even after millions of lifetimes of rejecting him, if we again turn to Krishna, he's immediately ready to accept us. He doesn't hold a grudge against us. He's immediately ready to forgive all our offenses against him. So, Krishna loves us unconditionally. This uh, transcendental quality of his permeates all his activities and all his dealings. Permeates. Permeates. It's present in. It's present in, It's latent in. And this love that Krishna has for his devotees reciprocally uh, instigates in them the desire to fully give themselves to Krishna. So the devotee is ready to fully give himself to Krishna because Krishna is fully ready to give himself to the devotee. So it becomes a very close heart-to-heart relationship. Mm. Krishna says that devotees are in my heart and I am in their heart. I don't know anything but them and they don't know anything but me. uh, So this is attractive even to transcendentalists who are free from material attraction. Transcendentalists have understood that this material world, all the so-called love is simply cheating. They remain aloof from mundane relationships. But when they hear about the relationships of Krishna with his devotees, 
they also become attracted. This is what happened with Shukadev Goswami. He heard the Bhagavatam and immediately was attracted. He realized that although he was thinking he was on the topmost platform of transcendence, that there was something more, something more to understand, that is Krishna. So such a devotee, when he takes up devotional service, um, then he does so in an unmotivated way. Many people perform devotional service with some material desire in mind. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me this, give me that, give me something else. But the uh, those who are on the platform of transcendence, they're already beyond such petty desires. So when such a person takes to Krishna consciousness, he immediately does so on the unmotivated platform or the topmost platform. Some people come to Krishna conscious with many material desires. They think, let me worship Krishna and uh, Krishna will bless me with so many material benefits. So such a person can uh, be gradually purified and become free from such material desires, become a pure devotee of Krishna and engage in unmotivated devotional service. If he gets the association of advanced devotees and if he engages in devotional service very intensely, Akama sarva kama va moksha kama udaradhi tivrina bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. Therefore, it's recommended that if one is, whether one is desireless, full of desires, or desiring liberation, whatever position one may be in, one should very intensely perform devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There are many examples of such devotees who came to Krishna with some material desire and later become purified. Prime example is that of Dhruva Maharaj, who had a very great material desire, very ambitious. Someone is ambitious to become the district governor, someone is ambitious to become the head of his state, someone is ambitious to be the head of the whole country, someone is ambitious to become a demigod. But Dhruva Maharaj, he thought, ah, my father has insulted me, I will show him, I will be much bigger than him. He, he wants to deny me a seat on his throne. I will get a throne much better than his. He desired a position even better than that of Brahma, which was unthinkable. He had such a big material desire that could only be fulfilled by Vishnu. So with this in mind, he took up the worship of Vishnu, who fulfilled his desire. But because he performed devotional service so intensely and under the guidance of a great pure devotee, Narad Muni, uh, he was blessed with becoming free even from such a big, big material desire. So there is hope for us all. Even though we have, may have many material desires, if Dhruv Maharaj could be purified of such a big material desire, we can no doubt be purified of our petty material desires. As Srila yeah, Prabhupada right. commented, it is not at all difficult to become a pure devotee, free from all material desires. We simply have to become as determined as Dhruv Maharaj. Dhruva, the very word means fixed, immovable, firm, fixed up. So that's one way to come to devotional service and be purified, to come from the material platform and become purified. Another way to come is to come from the spiritual platform, where one is already fed up with this material world and identifies himself as pure spirit soul. And such a person in such a position, if he takes up devotional service, there's no question of him taking to mixed devotional service. He'll immediately go to pure devotional service. This is what happened with... Shukadeva Goswami with the four Kumaras. Uh, there are different uh, attitudes with which one can take up devotional service, which have been classified into four basic categories by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Jatur Vidha Bhajante Mangjana Sukritin Arjuna Arto Jignyasur Artharti Gyanicha Bharata Arshabha. He says that four kinds of pious people take to my devotional service. Those who are distressed those who are desirous of wealth, those who are inquisitive, and those who are in knowledge of transcendence. So four examples of, of this, these kind of people have been given in the nectar of devotion, culled from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Who knows the example given of someone who is distressed, who took to devotional service? Can anyone say? Anyone? And that's not the example given in the nectar of devotion. Yeah. She was already a devotee. Gajendra. Gajendra is the example. Then someone who wanted some material gain. I just, I just spoke about it for the last ten minutes. 
from uh, those who are inquisitive? Anyone? Shonak Adi Rishi, the Rishi is headed by Shonak. And uh, Gyani, those who are on the platform of transcendental knowledge. The four Kumaras. And Shukadev Goswami is another example who we're discussing today. So uh, Krishna goes on to say in the next verse, Udara Sarva Evaite Gyani Tvat Maiva Mematam. Next verse in Bhagavad Gita. That. Uh, these are all great souls, no doubt, anyone who takes a devotional service. But the best is the jnani, or the one who takes a devotional service in knowledge. Because from the very beginning, he, is, he, he approaches only for the sake of Krishna. He has no personal desire. Now you may say, well, the inquisitive, they may say, what's their personal desire? It's some intellectual curiosity. But those who are on the platform of transcendental knowledge, they have, they have nothing... No personal desire. They don't want to take anything from Krishna. So if one takes a devotional service without personal desires, then he is blessed with so many realizations by Krishna. Those who come to Krishna consciousness with some material motive in mind, they cannot understand this philosophy. They are not blessed by Krishna with proper understanding. That's why we see sometimes even within our ISKCON society, which is supposed to be promoting pure devotional service, Sometimes some deviant philosophies are promoted. Prabhupada has presented this philosophy so straightforwardly and clearly that it would be, and it would be expected that anyone who took to the serious study of these books should be able to understand them. Even within the books, Srila Prabhupada has already discussed practically every kind of deviation that could possibly take place. But still we find that People in devotional service, they make, they deviate, or they misinterpret Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Or another thing they may do is to minimize his instructions. So sometimes we hear people say, well, you know, Prabhupada's books, they're not so advanced. We want to read something more. And it's not really very relevant for us because we're already on a higher level. Yes. Or they say that Prabhupada didn't really know what he was teaching because, you know, he didn't come from the West, so he didn't know how to teach us properly. And all this... All this excessive emphasis on controlling the senses, it's not very practical. What is all this far regulated principles? And so they will uh, argue and discuss and make up some bogus philosophy. It happens in every religious path. It's like it's, it's very clear to any serious biblical scholars that Jesus was a vegetarian. And for the first 300 years of the Christian church, it was only the Christian church and there weren't so many divisions, that all the Christians were vegetarian. But nowadays the Bible is presented as if Jesus was a big meat eater. Why? Because people want to eat meat and consider themselves religious also. So you just have to change a few words in the Bible, convert Jesus into a meat eater, and you can be too. Now this happens in all religions of the world that uh, unscrupulous people reinterpret for their own sense gratification. They say, well, this religion is quite good. It's quite nice. Get the blessings of God. Well, why not? It's free. Just have to say a prayer or two. doesn't take much time. If there's anything in it, if there's any to be, anything to be had, well, why not? What's the harm? Or other people may think, well, I'd better look religious. Otherwise, people won't have a very good opinion of me. That's why in countries where... Most of the people are religious. The politicians, they make a point to be seen in the church or the mosque. So the people think, oh, he's a very religious person. And they're not going for love of God. They're going for to enhance the, their political prospects. So people may uh, take to religion with so many material motives. Or as Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the people. Religion is a very powerful motivating factor in people's lives. So those who are interested in manipulating others for their own ulterior purposes, they may think, well, I'll become a religious leader. And in this way, it's easy to gain control of the people. So these contaminations enter into the path of religion. When people have material desires and they want to take advantage of religion, then you get koitava dharma, cheating religion. And we shouldn't be so naive as to think, well, it can't happen within ISKCON also. It can do also. Therefore, we are very carefully studying Srila Prabhupada's book to see what is Prabhupada representing all the previous acharyas presenting us with. 
and our movement will be successful as much as this mood of pure unmotivated, unmotivated devotional service is kept alive. If we become more interested in buildings, position, and all this kind of thing than in pure devotional service, then we lost the yes, mood of Krishna consciousness. Of course, in Russia, our movement isn't uh, economically thriving. Maybe that's good, because sometimes when you have big, opulent temples, then uh, people, sometimes they want to enjoy the facilities for sense gratification. Prabhupada often used to quote his own Guru Maharaj in this regard. Bhakti Sansar Thakur said that when we used to stay in a rented house, then it was very nice. But since we got this opulent, big marble temple donated, now they're fighting who will have the best room. He said, better we break the, break the temple, sell the marble, print books, rather than fight over properties. Bhaktisthan Sarasvatthakur said, I did not come to this world to be a building contractor. I have not come to uh, simply for making contracts with building companies. But I've come to preach the message of Rupa and Raghunath Goswamis. So the temple is useful in as much as it is used for preaching the message of the Acharyas. Again, when he was asked that, well, why are you building temples? There are already so many temples. He said that we need a place where we can speak our own message without any disturbance. Again, he was asked that, well, if you're building temples, there's no provision for their future maintenance. Traditionally in India, when the temple is built, lands are given with it. So the temple will get some income and there'll be no worry, economic worry in future. Bhakti Sansa Sartago said, no, we don't want any such means of maintenance. That our men, they should go out and preach from the temple. And then if they preach and the uh, people are impressed with their message, then automatically they'll give some donation. Said, if our men don't go out and preach and they simply sit and money comes, then what's the use of having a temple? He said, there are already so many griha medis at home, people who live in their griha, in their home, who are attached. So there's no use to make a class of mata medis, people who live in the mat or the temple and are simply attached. He said that uh, it's good, if there's no land, then our men will have to go out to preach. Unfortunately, that spirit was lost in the Gorya Mat. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada had found it necessary to start the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So we often emphasize to devotees that you should remain within the spiritual shelter of ISKCON. That is not simply some kind of dogmatism on our part. But because we see that within this movement, the main thrust is to push people back to Godhead. Although there may be many classes of people within this movement the main thrust of the movement is towards pure devotional service. Therefore, we recommend people to remain within this movement so for their own benefit. However, it is a constant job of the leaders to see that deviations don't enter. In ISKCON, we have, according to Srila Prabhupada's edict, collective leadership. Because even if one person among the leaders deviates, then others will carry on in the proper spirit. So this is another of the uh, strengths of ISKCON, that even though someone may be a leader and highly elevated, exalted and respected, that the principles given to us by Guru, Sadhu and Shastra, they are more important than than uh, any single person. This movement is based on the principles of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So even if one is himself a Guru, but, uh, uh, even if one is himself a Guru, but he deviates from the principles of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra, then uh, he's no longer allowed to occupy that post. So that is a strength. This is a protection against corruption entering. Otherwise, the whole thing can be spoiled. Just like that example, Christianity, they, they, cha they, they changed, very big and very bad change, they changed from being vegetarians to meat eaters. Because the material desires of certain leaders were allowed to prevail over the principles. 
Anyway, it's a very big subject. There are many things to say, but we don't have much time. So I'll rather abruptly stop here. <coughs> Maybe I'll take one or two questions. Say it loudly so that others can hear. So that it can come over to the tape here also. You mentioned that you went to the devotees should perform service in this court, within this court. What does it mean to act within this court? It means to... Uh, what does it mean to act within this court? It means to act under the guidance that is coming down through the GBC body, down to the local level of authorities, and follow the principles given by Srila Prabhupada. It may mean living within one of the ashrams of ISKCON, or it may mean uh, being a member of the congregation. Although it may be difficult to define exactly, it's in practice it's fairly, it's fairly uh, clear what it means. To associate with the devotees of ISKCON, to cooperate with them, well, to, to act under the guidance of the devotees. Mm. Any other question? From what planet did uh, Jesus come and is he a pure devotee? Prabhupada recognized him as a pure devotee. Exactly which planet, I don't know, but uh, presumably from the spiritual world. Exactly which planet is not so important. What is the consciousness? Pure devotional consciousness. One may live in the material world or he may live in the spiritual world, but if he's in pure devotional consciousness, then he's always in the spiritual world. Is it possible, is it possible to come to pure devotional service uh, in some other organization other than this movement of Krishna? Well, you have to see if pure devotional service is being taught and if there's any practical process to bring you to that point. I mean, there are various organizations that discuss it in this world and have it as their proposed aim. But uh, in practical terms, I don't see anything as effective or dynamic as this one, where there's, um, there's so much literature, there's so much literature to help aspiring devotees. There are so many activities to help aspiring devotees. Over and above all, there is the blessings of Srila Prabhupada. So in, in my estimation, as far as I can see, the there is no organization which uh, is even slightly as good for coming to the platform of pure devotional service. And our organization has problems, as are being much publicized nowadays. Although there was never a day since this day organization was founded when there weren't problems, and there will never be a day in future when there will not be problems, because we are living in the material world, which is the world of problems. And there is no organization of any type within this world that also is not full of problems. But actually it wasn't Prabhupada's mood to always think, oh, this problem and that problem. Prabhupada's mood was to push on the preaching, chanting, to emphasize on the positive. And if we remain positive in devotional service, we'll, we'll see there's so, so much nice chanting, so many sincere devotees, such a wonderful thing this organization is. And with that enthusiasm, you can take advantage of the wonderful gifts that Prabhupada is offering in ISKCON and also become advanced. But if you always see so many faults, then uh, by, by always thinking of the faults, you yourself will become so much negative and you won't make any spiritual advancement and you'll blame it on ISKCON. And it's up to you. The all opportunity is there for spiritual advancement, but we have to take to it with the proper attitude also. It also requires some patience. Don't think that, you know, you just all of a sudden, psh, you become a gopi. You can become a gopi. But actually we should think of becoming servants. Some people in India, men, they dress themselves as gopis. And they talk in women's voices. And move like women, shave twice a day, and think that they're gopis. But they're not. So this movement is uh, very practical and very joyful. If there are problems, or if you have problems, remain patient. Problems are Krishna's gift to help to purify us. The pure devotee Kunti Devi prayed to Krishna once, complained to him that 
You're not giving me any problems these days. How am I going to become a pure devotee if you don't give me any problems? So, we'll take one more question. You might have mentioned that Krishna is in a mood of fractal material qualities, but it's full of transcendental qualities. Aren't they the same? How can we distinguish between material and transcendental qualities? The difference between material and transcendental qualities is that material qualities are based on envy of others the desire to exploit others so and, and the misplaced desire to enjoy this material world separately from Krishna. Spiritual qualities arise in a heart in which there is only the benefit of others in mind. That is possible to understand when we stop identifying with this body and with this material world. Hare Krishna. 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 Muslims say that in Quran it is allowed to eat meat. So you see that it's, uh, it's directed to people who are not on a very high level. So it may be all right, it may be okay for them at their stage, but when one comes to a higher level, then naturally it doesn't like to eat meat. Although the Quran and the Bible can help people at a certain level, it doesn't give clear information about who is God or even what he wants. Yes. Even in the Vedas, meat eating is allowed. But that's not meant for the topmost transcendentalists or any transcendentalist. So therefore we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the ultimate